Thank you. Please. Well, thank you to Pastor Vishnu, Lisa, for the warm invitation, the, the generous hospitality for receiving us as if Christ is in, in your midst. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Apostle Berenja for, for availing himself. I think this meeting was planned before COVID and I would not have come back to Trinidad, but because of a promise I made to, to um, Vishnu that we'll come to assist in building whatever the purposes of God are. And it was great listening to the word that you shared with us today. Tremendous impartation of grace through a life that has been very pragmatically lived out. Thank you. Uh, great to have all the other speakers, Donald and Judith. And uh, it's the first time we're getting to meet with them and then to see others that I'm quite familiar with. Pastor Raj and his wife Sita. I saw Dave Krapa and Maurice, and Joseph and, and Terry and maybe others here that uh, we will get to know better in the days ahead. And to have our friends from Argentina here. Uh, they say that the best wine comes from Argentina. I don't know about that because in Chile, I think it's better. <laughs> well, it's a tremendous privilege to share the word of the Lord with you. As you know, I've come with Randolph and Selvin, who are great exponents of the word of the Lord, tremendous teachers. And um, just listening to the previous two speakers that have already shared the heart of God, it realizes, I've realized that they've covered all the scriptures that I'm going to share. Uh, it would be an ideal occasion to take a vacation uh, from preaching and just enjoy the beaches here. You know, we all stand, well, true servants of God, stand before the throne of God. And while there are various emanations that comes from God's throne. There's only one agenda at any one point in time. And anyone who speaks from that throne can only articulate the message that they receive from God directly. And sometimes we get caught up with the, man uh, the manifestations of thunders and lightnings and various sound waves and and we forget that there's only one message that comes from God at any one time. No two moves of God can take place at the same time. The Ark of the Covenant can only be in one tent even though there was two tents uh, in Israel. Uh, the tent at Shiloh and the tent in Jerusalem, but the ark could not be in both places even though God is omnipresent. God chooses to work in a singular, very articulate and direct way. It had to take John the Baptist to be beheaded before Jesus could exercise his ministry on the earth. And similarly, Moses had to be removed before Joshua was established. And I think the point I'm making is that if we are truly hearing God presently, we will receive a very clear message from him and there will be congruence there will be symbiosis, there will be um, concord, agreement, and obviously all of us will have an internal witness uh, 
that speaks to the things that God is saying. Mm -hmm. You've heard reference by Jerry uh, about COVID being a divine judgment. I'm convinced that nothing global can happen with that without divine permission. We can chat to Job about that when he was judged. We can speak to the judgments that came upon Egypt in the days of Moses, or even Jeremiah, who spoke about a judgment that will take God's people into captivity for 70 years. And no matter how you prophesied against that judgment, it was divinely permitted. And as God said in Jeremiah 29, 11, that the plans that I have for you are for your peace and prosperity was not to Israel in Israel. It was to the remnant that would ta be taken captive and would prosper in Babylon. So discerning the times are fundamental requisites for the establishment of God's purposes. One of the things that God did, and we need to sometimes while I'm not a contextual preacher and I don't believe the context should determine how we speak the gospel, we receive our gospel not from the environment, the climatic conditions, or the situations that we find ourselves in. Our gospel comes from the throne of God and we receive it from outside of time so that we can speak it into the chronologies of time. So it's in that context we must understand that God permitted a judgment and certain natural environmental conditions should at least help us to interpret from the natural the spiritual. First the natural, then the spiritual. One of the things that happened during COVID was that God literally shut down our religious activities. And the purpose was of all judgments, it's not to be punitive, but to be restorative. Yes. And the purpose was, firstly, to bring us back to himself. Some of us are so addicted to ministry that we don't even know who the Lord is. So we live from his hand instead of looking into his face. And so God used COVID to bring us back to himself and the venue that God used was our homes, our domestic residential units. That speaks volumes in itself because we couldn't do our praise and worship as we were institutionalized by religious traditions to do it. We couldn't do our spiritual warfare by bringing our intercessors together like the way we do it in church liturgies and a whole lot of stuff literally shut down. It was in technological language God bringing us back to our default settings, uh, back to, to a reset of how church should be done. People like myself who travels extensively had to be delivered from ministry so that I can learn how not to do things and just enjoy him. Him. Not very easy when you're traveling all the time. Delivered from your favorite sermons, which you hope will open more doors for you so that you can say you've colonized some parts of the world. But God was bringing us back to himself. I think God imposed a Sabbath rest upon the earth where the wheat and the tares had to grow, the sheep and the goats, and uh, the sons of God and the sons of the evil one. And it was in that context that God was establishing a separation uh, at a very, very precise time in the history of the church. If you really study biblical history, you will find that the whole Bible has a patrilineal culture to it. You cannot read the Bible 
unless you have the spectacles of seeing things from a patriarchal order. The scriptures were not written to individuals first. It was written to a community as a corporate entity made up of individuals. And God was bringing us back to family. If we trace the history of humankind, we'll find that it was in the home where God very, very definitively established his, his, his plan for how human society would effectively function. For example, the home was the, well, it was the center of religion. You study the order of um, Adam and Eve after the fall. It was within the inter enterprises uh, and within the context of their home that God established everything he wanted to do. Uh, to do. So the home became a place of training, of education. Uh, it became the university. It became the basis from which business was conducted. In fact, everything centered around the home. Um, the Old Testament concludes the Old Testament genre of scripture concludes with a very provocative and paradoxical verse. And it is that Malachi chapter 4, and I will send to you the spirit of Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to, the, to their children or sons, and the hearts of the sons to the fathers, lest, lest I smite the earth with a curse. The word curse in the original Hebrew literally means to reduce the human race to redundancy. The language is patriarchal, familial. The language is that God, unless he raises families, will reduce the human race to redundancy. He will, he will render them idle or inactive. And their silence in terms of the spoken word or written word of God for almost 400 to 430 years before the, the gospel of Matthew is given to us the gospel of Matthew is given to us with patriarchal language this is the generation or the, the patrilineal or the, or the lineage of Jesus Christ the son of Abraham, the son of Abraham, the son of David, or the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it gives us 14 generations. And Abraham begat Jacob, Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and Judah begat Perez and it gives us a lineage that goes down to supposedly the father of Jesus Joseph who is number 40 on the list Jesus and Joseph supposedly uh, the father of Jesus begat Jesus and Jesus gives birth to the 42nd generation which is a perfect man on the earth and that generation is the church of Jesus Christ this present generation which shall not pass away until everything that God said will be fulfilled all all patriarchal language so Randolph read a very powerful portion of scripture today when he pitched his thoughts to us and he started by saying unless you build unless the Lord builds by hit by hit means family 
not domestic physical buildings, not residential units. Unless the Lord builds family, whatever you build is rendered invalid, is thrashed. If you're building a worship center, that's invalid. If you're building a, a, a deliverance church, that's invalid. If you're building a mission center, that's invalid. If you're building an apostolic house, that's invalid. If you're emphasizing peripheral things, that's invalid. Unless you build family, whatever you build is in vain. And if you read the section portion of Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, And the watchman watched the city in vain. Same verse. In other words, if you don't build family correct, the security of the environment in which you live is endangered. And no spiritual warfare, no watchman ministry will be able to create immunity, covering, and security unless the order is right. If you study the Old Testament, like the book of Numbers, families became armies. So you never built an army. You built a family like Abraham in Genesis 15 when he was going to confront Chedorlaomer and the coalition of kingdoms uh, so that he could redeem his brother Lot, who was his nephew, but technically uh, the kinship principle. And Abraham armed his 318 servants, and the word armed means imparted the same ability that he had upon the 318 who were like sons to him. They carried the same spirit as him. And it was Abraham's family that confronted kingdoms and brought them down. Yes. Let me give you familiar language that goes, that's from 1 John chapter, I think it's chapter 3 or 5. For this reason the Son of God was manifested. The Son of God. And that's not just referring to the patent Son, the blueprint called Christ, but the corporate Son, which is the church. That He might destroy the works, the employment, the activities of the devil. So God designed it such that sons will destroy or deconstruct or eliminate or drive Satan out of the earth. So it's 3.8. He that com for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, made visible that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the point I'm making is that we are living in a time where the emphasis is on building a strong, not house, because houses for us become technical references to our, to our dwelling places, but a house is just another building. It's the people that characterize it. For example, if a people lived in, in a region called, according to the allotment of inheritances, a place called, um, if a tribe called Benjamin lived in a certain space, then that province was called the province of Benjamin. In other words, your f the, the principal features that characterize who you are infects and imparts that personality to the environment. So if you were people from the tribe of Judah and you lived in a spatial context, then that whole tribe uh, so transfers its fundamental characteristics into the environment, and the environment is called Judah. So when we talk about house, we're not talking about house, we are talking about a people who gives definition to the context in which they live, and that people then influence that environment. And uh, the language that God always used is the language of family. And unless we can see that, we will, we will live our lives misinterpreting and misplacing 
fundamental communications that's contained in the Holy Scriptures. And you know, one of the greatest challenges that we all have today in, in leading Christ out of the Scriptures, especially the patterns, the designs that God has for His church and for the establishment of His kingdom, one of the greatest challenges we have is that we live in a post-modern world. Postmodernism is a delusional doctrine concocted by Satan himself. Postmodernism tells you, and I'm going to oversimplify it, that the individual does not need to have a, re a point of reference for how he or she lives today. Postmodernism enshrines the whole idea of individualism. In other words, it tells you that you have the right to exist how you want to exist. That's postmodernism. It glorifies individualistic living. By that I mean it tells you that you can construct your life the way you think it's best for you. That's postmodernism. It removes ancient landmarks by saying there's no absolutes in life. It's your opinion. So if I tell you today that spiritual fathering is a way in the scriptures, is a way of God in the scriptures, you probably will tell me that that's my opinion. And I have my own view of how leadership should take place in the church. This is individualism magnified and glorified. And unfortunately, we're living in a world today where the culture of this world is so contradictory to the culture of the kingdom, as we heard, that, that things like family, spiritual fathering, being the sons of God, contradicts the way the world wants us to operate. The world is suggesting that we create a hybrid of ourselves, that we operate as a half Jew and a half Gentile. That, that's a Samaritan position. But God is calling for a pure man, pure, clean, undefiled, uh, an incorruptible man, uncontaminated to operate in the world. And unfortunately, People today don't want that kind of a man. What people want is a, a hybrid. They want to create an image of themselves and let that m image become the model of how the church should function. And, and, and these, these things create tremendous conflicts in the spirit. So when you talk family today, it cuts against the culture. The culture. Uh, that this world is enshrining. And you do know that most of us live in a democratic world. And may I, I don't want to be controversial here, but my, may I be provocative and tell you that democracy is as evil as communism. And democracy has lost its bearings so much so that we could have the woke movement now that tells you that every person has a right to choose his or her affiliations and preferences and so forth. And, uh, and it's all part of an existential culture, which simply means that you can choose your orientation sexually, uh, your view on the idea of this primitive concept called marriage, and you can live how you want to live, where you want to live, and in what situation you want to live it. And as a result, today, there's nothing you can say from the church that won't be challenged, interrogated, and, and, and produce what we call in Babylonian language confusion. 
And that's why there's so much of gross darkness in the earth, which simply means ignorance. And it's compounding, it's composite, it's creating serious problems. I mean, Jesus asked a very simple question. Well, James, James, the brother, of, the half-brother of Jesus, he was trying to define religion. And he said the true religion, pure and undefiled, I think it's James chapter 1, verse 17, is to care for the widow and to visit the fatherless. He was not saying that true religion is to have orphanages and widows' ministries. If he was saying that, then the Muslims have true religion, the atheists have true religion, the Hindus have true religion, and many Christian churches who have these programs will also have true religion. But to visit the fatherless and to care for the widow very simply means, so who is fatherless? A one who does not have a father. Am I correct? Who's a widow? A widow is one that does not have a husband or a father in the home. So how do you fix true religion? How do you establish true religion? All you have to do is engage the anointing of Elijah, restore the spirit of father over the house, and the widow will say that I am no more a widow, and the fatherless will say that I am no more fatherless. Am I correct? And then true religion is coming to the church. According to Malachi and so many other portions of scripture. So what do we have in our churches today? We have male-dominated leadership in large parts of the church. But we have absent fathers. So you can be a male leading your church and still be like a custodian or a steward over an orphanage. Or we can call it a widow's house because when you remove the father, and the word for father in the New Testament is not father, it's elder. It was the custom of people like the Apostle Paul to command Titus 1.5, to command Titus, and command means not negotiable. Command means this is the way you do it. To appoint elders, episcopos, presbyteros, and go and study the range, the semantic range of these words. You can study theologically, you can speak, study it ideologically, or you can just study it linguistically. It will all tell you that those words speak of fathers. Men who have the characteristic features to know how to rule their own homes if they want to rule the house of God. Men who carry fundamental features and characteristic abilities of parenting, like fathers. And it was the Apostle Paul that said to people like Titus and to people like Timothy, it is our custom to appoint elders of every house. The church was never designed to be led by pastors. Never designed. Show me how many times in the New Testament the word pastor is used over a family. Maybe you can quote the, the fivefold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4 and he appointed some to be pastors. The word poimen for pastor is very seldom found in the whole of the New Testament. And that's simply because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if the church is a family, then a family is not headed by anyone else, but primarily and fundamentally a father. 
and I'm not speaking in a, in a, in a generic, I mean, in, in, a, in a sexual way here by emphasizing that only men can become fathers. I'm using it as in the household of God where there's neither male nor female. It's all, configura it's all configurations by the grace of God. And I'm not saying that the pastoral grace is not needed in a father. Uh, David was a great shepherd even though he was a king. And Jesus was a great shepherd even though he is our everlasting father in, in, a con in the context of his name. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, uh, Prince of Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that you don't have to have an ecclesiology. You know, I've studied theology. I've studied ecclesiology. I've tried to work this fivefold ministry thing out. I really tried to work it out. There's only one time in the whole of the Bible the fivefold ministry is highlighted, and that is in Ephesians chapter 4, which is a very profound chapter in the Bible and I tried to work out how is it that you bring a fivefold ministry into a local church and I discovered that in the early days of the apostolic season people thought they were apostolic only when they put a fivefold ministry in every local church and so they had apostles and prophets and evangelists and uh, teachers, uh, pastors and teachers. And we entered into what I call false ordinations. Just to force ourselves into a template. I, many years ago, when my, one of my sons was pretty small, about five years old, I asked him, son, tell me, what is the governmental structure of the family? Five years. And he said to me, oh, that's very simple. Dad, mum, children, and sometimes servants. And I said, wow. He didn't say apostle. And I used to travel quite a bit. He didn't say, oh, Apostle, my wife is a qualified, you know, she studied theology with me, so she would, be, she would be classified as a pastor. No. He said to me, Dad, Mom, his three brothers, the children of the home. And we had somebody that served us in our home. She was our servant even though she's like a daughter in our home. And I just thought, what's the governmental structure of a church if the church is a family? That doesn't mean there's no place for the fivefold ministry. I think it has a profound place within the ecclesiology of God. But because we have such an individualistic view of the church, And we all want to comply with being apostolic. We've messed up in the organizational structure of the church. And so I say to us today, we have to, you know, all I'm saying here is that we have to go and read the Bible again. <laughs> Let's go and read it. Let's interrogate it, let's, I mean it in a good way, tear the scriptures, do what the Bereans did, listen to the apostle, then go to your home, work it out through the night, wrestle with God until you can come to terms with how we should be reading the Bible, because we've been so corrupted in our thinking by individualism. that the scriptures are not the way God intended it to be communicated. 
you heard in the last session that the movement or the emphasis of the season is to move from a religious institution, a temple mentality, to a family paradigm. And that's a youth thing because, you know, I do some ministry in India and our forefathers, like some of you here, come from India. I'm, I'm a third generation African. So don't judge me by the color of my skin or how I look. Um, and when I first went to India, I found it so strange. Everyone looked like me. Yet they spoke a very strange language and the, the food they ate was not so nice as the, ones in, as the food we ate in South Africa. But as I started to study the religious order there, I found that obviously uh, religion is very, very powerful uh, in India. You, you, it's almost a civic religious order of life then. Presently, uh, religious nationalism is increasing at an alarming rate. But what I found to be the biggest challenge with the Christian church in India, at least the groups that I went and spoke at, was that they, they took the wineskin of religious India and transplanted it into the church of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said you cannot take new wine and put it into an old wineskin. If your operational system is not right, whatever programs you have on it will crash. So the, the wine is templates, blueprints, revelations, insights of how God wants the church to function. But if the operational system, if the the substructures, the subsets, the ecosystems are not right. Whatever you put into that system will fail. Will fail. I discovered that the temple mentality of India, where people would go to a building to have an encounter with their God, with fear and trepidation, they would take off their shoes. Um, the priest became the holy man and if he put a little bit of you know he blessed you with some ash on your forehead and so forth um, you were blessed and if he gave you a word or some something that was said to you you had a sense of destiny and a definition of purpose and I found that that came into the church at least in South Africa, the communities I worked with, which was classical Pentecostal, uh, that I grew up in, and I found the same in India. They didn't understand that God was not building a religious system in the New Covenant. God was into nation building, building a new people group. Just put that time on for me, I just don't know. Sorry, you'll never have lunch if... I'm just speaking here today. I've actually stepped away from my notes. These guys said everything. Yeah, so... So we came to church to have an experience. We didn't understand that God was building a people. That God was into nation building. We didn't understand that. The new covenant, which is a covenant that was sealed in his blood, was a covenant that transitioned us from being orphans to becoming sons of God. The pattern is Egypt to the promised land. And the insights are that God said to Moses, like for example, Exodus chapter 4, 23, 24, and so forth. God said, tell Pharaoh that Israel is my son. 
my firstborn. Let my son go, it says in, in a later verse, that he may have a feast with me, not in the promised land, but in the wilderness. Look at the language, son. Is my son, firstborn. Feast, that he would fellowship with me, fellowship in the wilderness, not in the promised land, that I will first bring him to me before I bring him to my promises, that I will bring him from being an orphan under the control of Pharaoh to now becoming a son sitting at my table. And that's a pattern. In the new covenant, Christ on the tree that separated us in the Garden of Eden, reconciled us to the Father. He became everything that was serpentile so that we could be set free. We were never intended to be called Christians. It was people in Antioch, Syria, that studied a clan, a small group of followers of Jesus, believers, disciples. And they said, these people are just like Christ. So they coined the phrase Christian. God never called us to be Christians. God called us to be sons. For as many as received him, to them gave he the right, the executive privilege to be the sons of God. I'm not big on Randolph is my son or Selvin is my son. I think that's idolatry. I'm not big on that. I'm big on the idea that you have to be a son of God. That when you receive Christ, you become a son of God. So when people ask you what's your calling, don't tell them prophet or apostle. Because the eternal predestined election and calling is that he predestined us to be called the sons of God. Amen. Domestically, we may have some chores in a local church or in the administration of God's body where you can then talk about your domestic calling which ends at the grave called apostle, prophet, asher or whatever. But here's the order. How many more minutes do I have? Another? Oh, okay. Okay. So, and it's so important. It's so important that we, we grip this. God, in the new covenant, reconciled us back to him, where he will be our father, and we will be his sons or his daughters. Am I correct? So say to your neighbor, I'm a son of God. So, and this is so, so important to understand that. Now look at the language, and that's the point I want to make here. The, the point is that all that language is the language of family. It's not the language of religion. The language of religion is that God is the great creator. He is holy beyond description. That he is a consuming fire. And that it is impossible for any one of us to stand in his presence unless we go through serious processes of being detoxed and cleansed. That language is not New Covenant language. That's Levitical language governed by an Old Testament or Old Covenant order that secluded or excluded people from a certain level of engagement with God. The language of the New Covenant is that God is my Father, I'm His Son. That a Father 
removed the veil in Christ, the curtain that separated us from standing in his immediate presence, which is called the holies of all. And that portion of scripture that tells us that if God is our father and we are his children, then you don't need a secretary, a PA, or any protocols to get into his presence. You can run boldly into his presence. Now that's family language. The family language is that I have immediate access to my God irrespective of the challenges that I may be faced with. One of the most beautiful examples of that story is highlighted in the prodigal son. The prodigal son story is very simple. A man, and I'm going to read it again. Read Luke, uh, the story about the prodigal. A man came to his father and said, give me my inheritance. But if you went and studied it, he was actually not asking for material inheritance, even though it came. He, actually, the word is bios. Give me my own life. Give me independence. I don't want to perpetuate a transgenerational culture where I become an extension of you. I want to separate from you. The same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. When Adam basically through, through disobedience said, I don't want to become an exact representation of you. You may have created me to be your image and likeness, but I want to create my own image and likeness. Give me my bios. I want to create my own biology. I want to create something that will perpetuate my own image in the earth. That's what the saying. And the younger of them said to the father, give me that portion. Go and read the word portion of goods that followed to me. And he divided to the, to, unto him his bios. Go and read this in the original text. It's very frightening. That is why when, he, when the son came back, and, and when he came back, he was the equivalent of a pig, which is not kosher by Jewish standards. When he was, he lost everything. This is the words of the father to the second brother, the, to the righteous brother, self-righteous. He said, your, your brother was dead because he separated himself from life. Because your life is connected to your father. Because if you're in him, you will live forever. That's the doctrine. He's dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but he's now found. In other words, now that he's come back to his recalibrated position, he can now enjoy the things he lost. You see, it was not about a material inheritance. It's got to do with the salvation story. He became an orphan, but he now reconnected to fatherhood. And that's the story with all of us. We were dead. We were lost. And when we connected to God, our Father, we came into his family. That's the grand narrative. That's the overarching principle that I am a son of God. And I cannot get closer to God. Not through fasting, not through prayer, not through singing, not through giving. It's just a gift of God, by the grace of God, that I could be reconciled to him. And that's the closest relationship you can have. It's called the father-son dyad. It's conjugal, it's congenial, it's covenantal, it's symbiotic. I mean, there's not enough words I have in my vocabulary to talk about this union. To abide in the Father is to abide in the Son, which simply means that I'm not only just uh, connected to God, but I'm operating in the template that I've been conformed to. Romans 8.29. 
that we've been predestined to be conformed, squeezed into shape, into the image of his son. So I'm being, I'm squeezed now into that shape. So like Jesus modeled a relationship with his father, I can em emulate it. That's called discipleship. And you do know when discipleship, I mean, we all are followers of Jesus, am I correct? And Jesus didn't come to make us adherents of a religion. He didn't. Um, Jesus called us to be conformed to his image and likeness. Jesus, actually, the eternal Logos that became flesh, was bringing us back to the Genesis 1.26 27 model, which is, let us make man in our image and likeness. So God is not interested in how you become a member of a church. He wants you to become a son of his. That's the ultimate. But for him to make us his sons, there's a domestic administration of a heavenly principle. And the domestic administration is that he knows that we have to develop from being a child to a son. For, un, for unto us, a child is born. But a son is? The word given means established or appointed. So what did God do in the model, the template, the pattern called Jesus Christ? I mean, think about it. Think about it from a rational point of me. Just think about it. Here is the eternal Logos, the incorruptible seed, the pre-existent one, the one who created all things, who is the Word, the highest intelligence that is in God. He now is immaculately inserted into the womb of Mary, a virgin. The immaculation, the immaculate uh, installation of that seed did not in any way interfere with her virginity. And she's pregnant. She's also received information through angels, first-hand information, that this is God that will dwell in, in here. And he will bring deliverance to the world. He will save the world. Think about it. And then Jesus is born. And God convinces Joseph. Because God could have easily taken care of a single mother like he did to Hagar and Ishmael. And today we see the nations of Ishmael. As prosperous, if not comparative to the prosperity of Israel. Go and study the sons of Ishmael. Twelve sons. God could have easily taken care of Mary like he did Hagar. But God convinced Joseph, and God said to Joseph, Joseph, I don't want this boy to grow up in a home of a single mother. I want this boy to have a father. This is, this is the model that I'm going to build for future generations to study. And so Joseph's name gets added to the list of the tribe of Judah, supposedly the father of Jesus. Why? Because God needed the grace of a mother and the grace of a father over Jesus. Remember, he suspended or emptied himself of divinity. The suspension of divinity meant that he had to suspend his omniscience, his omnipresence, uh, his omnipotence. He had to become very man before he could again come to a place called very God. I mean, you think about it. This is, this is, we would never appreciate this if we don't have the familial view, the family view of things. And then, Obviously, the keys that God gave to Moses, uh, to Joseph and to Mary are prophetic words that they could trace back in Scripture. Scriptures like Isaiah and so forth, that, that a child will be born. 
that will be the most powerful exhibit of God himself. And you know that Mary came from the tribe of the, the, from the tribe of Levi, the house of Aaron. How do I know that she was a blood relative of Elizabeth, who was from the house of Aaron? To be of, a, to be of the same blood literally means that you belong to that tribe. Yes, yes, yes. So, she, so she comes from the house of the high priest. And, and Joseph comes from the house of kings, uh, 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 Ju the tribe of Judah. So yes, the high priestly anointing on a mother, the kingly anointing on a father, and that two anointings is going to raise up this child, triggering off all the scriptures in the old covenant that he now in his humanity will have to fulfill, fulfill under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that's how he becomes the Melchizedek of our lives. A high priest and a king, obviously, of kings. And how those two anointings, the lion and the lamb, comes into one. Under what? Under the mentorship of the fathering grace of Mary and Joseph. And obviously, they did it for 30 years. Imagine Emmanuel, God with you, in the earth for 30 years. 30 years. No miracles apart from the traditions we have in the apocryphal books. No miracles. N not much of a story about Jesus for 30 years. Probably a little bit of knowledge that he went to Egypt, came back to Nazareth, um, confounded the prophecies of theology and the priest in the temple at the age of 12, and then 18 years of silence. And who's fathering him? Who's mothering him through all of this? I know the individualistic mindset will say the Holy Spirit. But the reality is that the Holy Spirit used Mary and Joseph. The corporeal principle. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 68, God takes the solitary. The word solitary is the word yahed which literally means um, is only begotten, is one of his kind, unique, peculiar. The same word is used when God said to Abraham, take your only son Isaac and offer him. Yeah. And the only year is God takes the solitary and places them in families, plural, a singular son in families. God speaking about us. Lest we live in the land of the rebellious, that's what the Bible says. Which simply means that the order of God is that when we are saved, He brings us into a family of a custodian, a guardian, Galatians 4.1, a servant. And He says, take care of my son. For as long as the hair is a child, is under servants, custodians, and guardians until the time appointed by the Father, which is sonship. Yes. Woe is the land whose king is a child, but blessed is the land whose king is a son of nobles. So the process, the process is very simple. God takes us, puts us into families, places a stepfather, I call them representative fathers, guardian over us and says raise up this boy and eventually I'll claim him back at the river Jordan God said basically and I paraphrase this is not your son Mary this is not your son Joseph this is my son in whom I'm well pleased Amen. that's what we are doing yes. and and Jesus you can never study him and I'll close with this am I done I've got five minutes oh my god that's a long five <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about scriptures like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How would you de de define that portion of scripture? If you saw me, you saw the Father. I and the Father are one. Have I been so long with you that you do not know him? Portions of scripture like he came to lead the Father. 
or lead out of the bosom the Father in John chapter 1. These are very difficult scriptures to read if you read it independently. But the point is, God was giving us an example of what true discipleship is. True discipleship is not 20 steps to how you can become a good adherent of Christianity. True discipleship is that Jesus' ministry started at the age of 30 when God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The word pleased from the original Greek literally means this is the template, this is my will, this is the blueprint that I have for how all men who would follow Christ should live. So when Jesus said, I am the way, is basically saying, and, co and I quote, is basically saying, I, the Son, am the way, the truth, the life. You cannot get to the Father unless you learn how to operate as a son. If you operate in sonship, you can stand in the presence of the Father without protocols and restrictions. So when we talk about building a strong house, I wish it was about colonizing people and telling them that they have to become a son of some man in a house. That will be witchcraft. That will be manipulation and control. That will be autocracy. That will be a pharaoh concept of subduing the Son of God. I'm not interested in these guys being my sons. I'm more interested in how I can produce the Son of God in each one of them so that God can claim them at, his, at their Jordan that this is my son. And ministry only starts at sonship because that's when Jesus said, now the kingdom is at hand. In other words, now you have the I have the capacity to ex execute the right to rule over the domains of life. Because my father has coronated me through recognition as his son. So you cannot have a kingdom without the church. The church is the vehicle for the establishment of rule. In other words, without a king, there's no domain. Kingdom. The king is the church. The domain is God's rule over the earth. Kingdom. So you, can talk, you cannot talk about the objective of rule if you don't deal with the subject of son. Because God has given the kingdom to his son. And so what's the purpose of going back to the family model? It's very simple. When you build family with the right environment and with the right spirit, automatically sons are born. If you, culture, if you create the culture of family instead of institution, then the image of God will be restored to the church. And what is creation waiting for? The manifestation of the sons of God. That's how we're going to stop climate change. That's how we're going to fix the economies of the world. And that's how the glory of God will come back to the earth. So it's not about control, manipulation... It's actually about serving the purposes of God, and God understood that you cannot do that without establishing the family, the house of God. That's why that statement that Randolph and, and Jerry shared with us from Matthew chapter 16 is so important. Thou art the Christ, and the fullness of God was in Christ. Christ is the seed. Christ is the rock. And when you build on Christ, the manifestation of Christ is the image of God, which is called the Son of God. The world will see it. And all of creation is fatally attracted to the image of God in, uh, in each one of us. When the Son of God is revealed, creation will bow its knee to us. And that's how the force field of blessings will come to the church. I've exceeded my time. I'm going to stop. I just shared randomly. Basically what I did was scatter some seed thoughts. God bless you.